Frogbit Blog. Well, hello, and welcome to episode 52 of the Frogbit Blog podcast. You'll be glad to know Sexy Len is back again. We've got um, climate stuff, we've got nasty moles, and um, that's the animal, not the growth that you have. Um, we've got, is it okay to talk about drugs? Especially this week now, the Tories are all starting out to admit they're all drug takers, yeah? We've got Hope It Hurt, rich people doing good eco things, and in the de- deepest, deepest, deepest secrets of our souls, I revisit panpsychism. So, well, there's a lot to fit in, so listen up. Well, this is this is hopeful, isn't it? Public concern about the environment has soared to record levels in the UK since the visit of Greta Thunberg to Parliament and the Extinction Rebellion protests in April. The environment is now cited by people as the third most pressing issue facing the nation. Yeah, um, environment was ranked after Brexit and health, um, but is ahead of the economy, crime and immigration. Young people rate wildlife problems such as climate crisis and global annihilation of wildlife even higher, placing them second behind Brexit. Almost half of the 18 to 24 year olds chose environmental issues as one of the nation's three most pressing concerns compared with um, just over a quarter of the general population. Well, obviously, because they're going to be the ones that are going to have to suffer it more than more than those old folk, aren't they? Um, so, good, let's keep it up then. I mean, really, it should be way out in front there, shouldn't it? Um, but at least it's moving um, up the fear charts, as it were. And you never know, if we keep at it, it may end up being the Christmas number one. Wouldn't that be great? Right, well, I've been on a bit of a roll, haven't I, listeners, with them, what the UK's good at these days. We've had the past couple of podcasts that feature what the UK's good at. Not not by any planned thing, really, just the way that it's worked out, yeah. Um, I don't know if you can hear me dog barking in the background. Just to let you know, I'm not in the sun house um, this, this episode. And you know why? Because it's fucking freezing and it's pissing down with rain. So I'm doing part of it in the house, yeah. So anyway, um, we've covered food banks and poverty in the past couple of episodes that we're really good at. And what else? Well, we're actually really good at rolling out the red carpet for climate-denying neo-fascists and the making, aren't we? (laughs) The Trumps are in town. Lock up your daughters and hide away any ethnic minority you might be or you might know. Um, I don't really want to talk about Trump visit. It just disgusts me so much. Um, But still, here in the UK, we've got our own mini-Trumps in the making, haven't we? We've got Boris and we've got Nigel. I mean, Boris, Nigel, Donald, they even sound like twats, don't they? Anyway, what the, this other good thing I read that we're really good at in the UK, in fact, we're best in the world at this one, is tax havens. Yep, Britain has been described as the greatest enabler of corporate tax avoidance in the world. After it was revealed, eight out of the ten jurisdictions with the highest corporate tax haven scores are British tax territory, Brit- uh, British territory, sorry. Research by the Tax Justice Network found that the UK and its corporate tax haven network to be by far the world's greatest enabler of corporate tax avoidance, um, with scores of its territories and dependencies um, all landing in the top ten offender list. Get the fuck in. If there is a tax avoidance Olympic event, we would win that one, wouldn't we? Doesn't it make you proud to be British one day soon to be renamed Spivland, probably, won't it? Welcome to Spivland. When we leave the EU, we can call ourselves Spidland. Spidland. <laughs> Spivland. So we're top at food banks, poverty and poverty denial, and tax avoidance. Um Can anyone see a link between all three? Because I certainly can. Anyway, welcome to Spivland. Um, This is a rather hopeful story. I hope of redemption for us all, because I was reading a story about an ex-mole catcher who has now written a book that's meant to be really um, really good, um, and I'm going to buy it soon just to sort of, you know, because I think it's, well, it sounds really good, but just the fact that he's actually seen the light. Um, And this is the story. 
Don't kill moles, warns former catcher Mark Haymar at Hay Festival. And um, that's a festival in a place called Hay, I think, not a festival about Hay. Um, not that, you know, that'd be a bit weird, but I'm not a matter to judge. I mean, who am I to judge? Hay. <laughs> anyway, the author says, despite animals' tendency to dig up lawns, they shall be left alone. Moles are antisocial, horribly violent, terrible parents and could not care less about your garden. But a former mole catcher has called on people to leave the creatures alone. Which is great, but he's not exactly selling it there, is he? Mark Hamer was once the only mole catcher in South Wales, yes, and for years he killed them professionally and he stressed humanely. But he no longer kills them and nor should they be killed, he told Hay Festival. Moles used to be trapped in their tens of thousands. There have been mole catchers around since Roman times. But these days they are not caught so much, so the population is absolutely astonishing. But it doesn't matter that it's astonishing. Let them carry on with their lives. We don't need to catch them. Good on you, Mark. Thanks for saying that, because we've got a, a van that ground our way, which is called Whack-A-Mole or something. It just seems so horrible and cruel anyway. If moles are digging up your lawn, then grow a wildflower meadow, he said. Now, what great advice is that? Having said that, they are horribly vicious, he admitted. If you pick one up, it will hiss and snarl. They are incredibly violent creatures, you know. I'm starting to sound a bit Asian there, so apologies, yeah. They don't even like each other very much. Now, he was discussing his book, How to Catch a Mole and Find Yourself in Nature, in which he recounts a life in which he fell in love with nature while sleeping rough before becoming a mole catcher. There you go. So a story of redemption. He was homeless. He had to sleep rough. He fell in love with nature. He killed a few thousand moles for a few years. But we'll forgive him for that because now he's moved on. OK, so there you go. I'm going to buy your book, yeah? Um, I'll, I'll stop there, yeah? But go on, yeah. All right, listen to this. A matador was gored up his backside by a bull, leaving him with a 10-inch wound to his rectum. A spectator screamed in horror. All right, so these spectators don't scream in horror when they slay a bull with knives, the bastards, but they scream that the matador got a bit of bullhorn up his ass. The French fighter, Juan Liel, was lifted off the floor for a few seconds as the bull drove its right horn into his bottom. Blood covered the back of Mr. Leal's torn trousers after the horn went straight through his gluteal region. The matador carried on despite suffering a painful 10-inch wound to his rectum and a possible fracture of his sacrum or sacral spine, and he later killed the bull and posed with its severed ear. Well, I hope it goes septic and you have to be amputated from the belly button down, you fucking twat. And I would just like to say at this point... Oh, good, I hope it hurts, I hope it hurts. Hey, it's been a while, but guess Ooh, who's yeah. back? It's Len again. It's sexy Len again. Ooh, yeah. It's Len again. Ooh, yeah, it's Len again. Len. Ooh, Len. OK, um, it's been a while, young man. How are you doing, sexy Len? He's back <laughs> again. It's been too long. I've missed it. It certainly <laughs> has. But we have actually, we should tell people, we did actually meet up because you're now a Fit for Life champion and you invited me along to a group meditation, didn't you? It sounds very, very grand, doesn't it? I know. Yeah, but, uh, but in reality, yeah, it's just part of our organisation, kind of a little bit of added value outside of our normal job role. Um, I decided to pick up on something called a Fit for Life champion, which is what I am, apparently. And you decided the best way to get fit was by sitting on the chair for 10 I, minutes doing nothing. Well, we're quite good as a sort of people who work in this organisation. We tend to do a lot of exercise and things uh, down in the gym and cycle to work, as we've talked about before. Yes. But I thought, let, let's let's move it on to other bits, like your brain. No, you've, it's right, and it's interesting, actually, isn't it? Because you'd think creative people would be lazy, wouldn't you? You'd always get the impression of, like, uh, musicians and artists is that they're so worried about the aesthetic that they're not really bothered. But, if, in fact, yeah. it just turns out that most people in that gym are actually 
part of the creative department more than any right. other representative, which I thought was quite interesting. For me, that, that actually, I've been thinking about that a bit myself, actually. And I think um, even creative people often have that sense of like overwhelm that I've talked about previously. And it's often like too much creative overwhelm, mm. too much workload, too much like cognitive stimulation. And often exercise is a good way to burn that stimulation off. I've compared it to like when you've got kids that need running off like um, and things like that. So if you've got a creative brain, it's almost like you're still tapping into that childlike elements and you need to run it off a bit. Like yeah. almost literally, you've got childlike energy still. Have you? Well, that'd good be, on you. Good on well, you. Well, some days. <laughs> yeah. I, I, for, for me, I've always thought that it's about being a Renaissance man or Renaissance people. Is mm-hmm. like you actually do a bit of everything, apart from you know, like the Greeks and the Romans. Did apart from the killing and the slavery. Aye. Well, you know, a bit of art, a, a bit of a sport. You yeah. know, um, discussions, all that kind of thing. I think mm-hmm. it, it's good to create rounded pe- people. It's good to be rounded, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and try and do so many things. There's a lot of cross pollination with all those things as well often like sort of if I'm if I'm on my bike then I'm thinking about the creative things it gives you it gives you time not to be distracted by other things I mean I've been it was an interesting podcast to listen to that was on about um, comedians writing uh, creatively uh, and often when they're on tour buses uh, they're scrolling constantly on the phones yes. whereas, and find it really hard to actually write new material whereas previously before they had phones uh, they used to be on a tour bus just staring out of a window and before they even realise it the, the ideas yes. are flooding yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and that for me that's me that's cycling and it, well no it's true isn't it because I'm the same and I've tried to make my cycling quite you know being um, in a meditative state really mm. and enjoying the moment because you've got to and especially this time of the year when mm-hmm. you're cycling through the woods and it's quite easy to be thinking right I get to work I've got to do that I've got to do that I've got to do that I've got to ring them and I'm thinking no you've got to enjoy the moment absolutely absolutely Easier said than done. Sometimes. Well, it is, isn't it? It is. Um, <laughs> it is important because we do have so many distractions in our lives, the phone being one of them, but yeah. it's easy to be constantly distracted, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And that's the thing I think is important about meditation mm-hmm. is the fact that you can fo- you're can you trying to focus on, you know, actually focus the mind. And I was saying to you, I can tell when I've been, I'm actually focusing because I'm getting rid of all the clutter and I'm actually mm-hmm. thinking of thoughts that I've not, something that I've not thought about for mm-hmm. 10, 20, 30 years it pops into my head because there's actually the space there for your long-term memory mm-hmm. to actually reappear not that you want those things to appear but that you know mm-hmm. I know that my mind's decluttering when I get that because yeah. I sort of think where did that thought come from where did I, I never thought of that thought since it happened 25 years ago about some hol- you know some bus ride on some holiday wow. somewhere it's absolutely incredible it is incredible yeah so you've actually tried you, you, your, your fit for life thing anyway is to <laughs> become a, a, the meditator mindfulness the meditator champion meditation yeah the, well yeah it's basically sort of we start off as once a week I'm hopefully going to do a little bit more in uh, sort of uh, within sort of the next few months um, it's, I'm early on this journey as well and again I'm not like I'm not doing it as in like a, a meditation expert that's for sure where I'm, I'm using the app like everybody else and I yeah. think there's your recommendation of the week which so app using the car map um, which is uh, sort it's of, like a car map it's a car well, not a car map it's a, it's a map that you have in a car to find out where you're going um, a calm app calm app yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, it's brilliant um, I've used it with my with my kids as well and they seem to get quite a lot out of it you it's just got, point it at them and shut up <laughs> please, please be calm yeah. um, but no they've actually got kids specific meditations they've got adult uh, specific meditations some for certain workplaces uh, sleep better um, in certain mental conditions like if you're sort of feeling anxious then there's a meditation for that as well oh right because I was listening to the Sam uh, Harris podcast because yes. his wife was on it because she was doing some stuff about um, consciousness which is really uh, interesting because yeah. she's been converted to panpsychism or she believes that mm. when she was looking at why the brain works is something that I started looking at you know the idea that it's a conscious universe and we mm. just sort of you know everything has a consciousness and there's a very basic level and we're mm-hmm. just sort of tapping into it because if if that isn't the case then what makes matter which we're all made of mm. some matter be conscious and others not be conscious you know, because mm-hmm. it's just a collective atoms or whatever. But anyway, wow. it was quite interesting. She's got a book out which I might I might read, and th- and mm-hmm. I think Sam Harris was going, yeah, but we're not new age. We're not new age. As soon, <laughs> yeah. as, soon as you talk about consciousness <laughs> and panpsychism, everyone, you know, oh, we can't be new age. It's yeah. a dirty word in aye, a way, which aye. is absolutely bizarre. Because I'm the same. I mean, we ended up get going on the guy. Um, my wife got the Gaia channel free for a month, and some of the stuff was really good, but some of it was yeah, so yeah, yeah. far out, really new age. You can see 
see where it gets a, a, a bit of a bad name. Well, it's funny when you mention the Sam Harris side of things. It's the um, he, he's trying to he makes a big point of putting a big a lot of distance between meditation and religion. Um, obviously, if you want to look into the, his other books and his podcasts and things like that, he's obviously got a lot on in regard to atheism and things like that, which is not what we're talking about today. Um, but it is uh, for me, meditation is, is very much a spiritual thing, but it's very very distant from religion, which is quite an important thing. Oh yes, yes, I think so. I don't think there's anything wrong with us all becoming more spiritual people. Mm. Um, but um, and it, she, anyway, there, she was on the podcast and she was talking about because she does meditation mm-hmm. with, with groups and like kids as, as young as four or five. And Absolutely. she said that it, it worked with them. So if you do do it with both your kids, if you try just it, my oldest uh, so, daughter, yeah, yeah. So, so I think she? uh, she's nearly five, right? Um, which is about a good a good age yes. to recommend to do that cognitively. Uh, whereas I think my two year old would have probably think yeah, differently. Yeah, I think too. Yes, um, yeah. I have tried it, um, yeah. but and she enjoys the the. It's I would. It's not music. It's more of ambient. And I think yes. she, she quite enjoyed the ambient side of things. Yeah. I've actually tried using uh, what's called like lo-fi hip hop music as well, uh, which I, I use when I'm either studying or uh, working in front of a computer, and it helps me to focus. I've tried using that when they're playing, and they tend to actually sort of come down a bit quieter, like come down a level, right. uh, basically, which I find is quite interesting. Uh-huh. Um, so that's uh, strangely enough, I actually have a lot in line with that lo-fi music playlist, which people can search for on YouTube and things. Um, in comparison to meditation, because it almost puts me in a meditation state to do yes. a job and work yeah which is quite oh, no, no that's really that's really interesting we've probably all got our our thing that that triggers that haven't mm. we um but anyway we actually ended up meditating in a group which mm. was the first time i've ever done that and it was sl- uh, did you feel all right about it i, I did actually yeah yeah, yeah. i mean uh, being the person hosting it i felt like uh, it puts me in a different position to those individuals who were taking part yeah. in it a bit so i have a certain level of responsibility to it so yeah, but let's just say to, it, you know. to people listening it was a guided meditation but Lem wasn't guiding that's you. True. You that's put true. the speaker on. You weren't going, Absolutely. now I want you to breathe deeply because that would have been a bit more pressure. It would. Would you ever like to get to that point where you're actually guiding it like that? I would. would you think? Yeah. I mean, a part of my, my job is, is a coach as well. So it's kind of in line with that as well, working with people and trying to work out the way that people think, and certainly not in a therapist way or a psychologist way, but just getting kind of just, I suppose I'm naturally a bit nosy, I suppose, and it kind of it works, <laughs> works for that, doesn't it? But it's like trying to get the, the best out of people and, and, and it, you know, if we can have it in a calm, mm. you know, and, and they do say, don't they, that the happiest people, I think there was it, they, they worked out that the happiest person in the world was a long term meditator, mm-hmm. I think was a Buddhist monk. I don't mm-hmm. know, you know, I don't know what criteria they use, and it's always a bit iffy, but yeah. you could see that they're having that in inner calmness, and you do Absolutely. see that in certain people, don't you? That inner tranquility that radiates yeah. to people. I would love to get to that point, me too, didn't you? Me too. It's early days for me, I think. Yeah, uh, so and how even... long have you been? Uh, well, I've dabbled with it for a good few months. Or certainly not previous to that, not at all. Really, yeah. it's kind of it's the, the kind of journey's just pointed towards me in a kind of natural way. It tends to be the things that I listen to, the things that I read, talk about these kind of things a lot. So I thought, well, I bet uh, it probably it seems right for me to give it a go. Really, yes, I think it's sustaining it. I got into it big time two years ago because we've been a teacher. I had all the summer off, mm-hmm. and I did this guided meditation. And one of the things that the bloke that talking about does is imagine the, the space around you, mm. and I. I actually managed to get to the point where I was sort of thinking outwards about how big <laughs> you sit there and you think god how big space goes in every uh-huh. direction in, in, infinitesimally yeah, is that yeah, the word yeah. and then I could actually <laughs> I managed to actually sort of picture myself in this little hut at the bottom of the garden where I do it and just actually look at myself from further and further and further and further yeah, away and it was actually like oh you know when you get to that point you think uh-huh. actually I've got somewhere now but then back into the routine of, of busy work I sort of uh-huh. got out the habit because I've I'd love to be able to do it before work, but yeah. I end up doing it after work, and quite often I get back and I'm starting doing it, and I can feel myself slightly nodding off. And there, that's okay. Which, yeah, you know, it's. I think yeah. a lot of it is. It's really interesting. I mean, for me, it's like it very quickly became almost like an out of body experience. And I like how at the end of the what the app that I'm listening to says, right now is the time to start wiggling your toes and your fingers and come back to the room. And I'm like, whoa, like where was I? Yeah. And and sometimes it, and I like the way that it forgives you that you're drifting away. It's yes. like a, it's, yeah. it's an acknowledgement, not a yeah. not a criticism of the process it's yeah. and the thing to remember about it is is that and i love about it is that um you don't you can't read about it and become good at it it's, you've got to do you've it you've got it's, to do it it's like yeah. running you've it's got to cycling. it's a muscle isn't it mm. or you know or whatever you've got to train your brain to do it you can't yeah you know, you've got to be in it to win it as it as it were still find the time is yeah. the thing for me that's yeah. <laughs> and on that note thank you for coming in <laughs> my, my, my pleasure um, we, should have, we should have a little uh, a dunk, little bell, a little a little bell yeah, there you go Thank you. <laughs> 
Is it okay to talk about drugs? Is it okay? Gonna do it anyway. Is it okay to talk about drugs? Now it's funny how these stories seem to come in groups. Um, and I've been talking a lot recently about where drugs and animals meet or where they intersect. And if you've been listening, a long, a long time listener, if you've gone back and listened, I did an episode last year on the subject called The High of the Tiger. Uh, yeah. The High of the Tiger. Well, it's happening again this time in bloody Devon, so it is. A driver who told police his car overturned because he had swerved to avoid an octopus in the road had taken a cocktail of drugs, Newton Abbott magistrates were told. Robert Shipley, 49, later said he had no recollection of driving before the crash near Kingsbridge in Devon. He pleaded guilty to driving while unfit through drugs at Newton Abbott Magistrates Court, the BBC reported police who attended on February 5th, said he was incoherent and mumbled to them about white bait, octopus and other sea creatures on the road. He also pretended to be reading an imaginary book about hedgehogs. Shipley told police officers, It got a bit bumpy for a while. I swerved to avoid an octopus. And it's pretty bad out there having to dodge all that white bait. <laughs> but here's the best bit. It then goes on to say, officers said they found no evidence of an octopus on the road. That's the best bit. They've actually gone out there and checked that there was no octopus when he said he was crashing into it. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, look, and I don't do drugs, but and just say no, kids. But, I, but if I did, right, if I did, I definitely want some of the ones that make you see octopuses and read imaginary books about hedgehogs. What drugs do that to people? Does anyone know? I'm quite intrigued now. I might go on the dark web and see what I can find. Google in drugs that make you see octopuses and read books about hedgehogs. And more on drugs. It's actually really hotting up in the Tory leadership um, campaign that's going on here in Britain. I think they're trying to out-drug each other. Here's one. A Tory leadership candidate has told Sky News he made a very stupid mistake to smoke opium while travelling in Iran. Rory Stewart admitted it was against the law when he tried the drug aboard, which is treated as a Class A in Britain, but it's probably not illegal um, in Iran, isn't it? So you weren't really breaking the law in that country, are you? If you go to Amsterdam and smoke cannabis, you're not breaking the law. You don't come back to Britain and go, oh, I've actually broken the law because it's the law of the land. Anyway... The International Development Secretary confessed in an interview with the Daily Telegraph to taking a puff to, oh, to taking a puff on an opium pipe 15 years ago at a wedding. I thought, this is going to be a very strange afternoon to walk, he recalled. I made a stupid mistake. I was at a wedding in a large community meeting and someone passed around this pipe and I smoked it. No, your stupid mistake wasn't smoking opium. Your stupid mistake was being a fucking Tory. Anyway, why do they all have to say, oh, it was a mistake? Why not just go, yeah, it was great, man. And another one, right, Michael Gove, another Tory hopeful, Michael Gove has admitted that he took cocaine as a young journalist, yeah? I took drugs on several occasions at social events more than 20 years ago, he told the Daily Mail. At the time I was a young journalist, it was a mistake. I look back and think, I wish I hadn't done it. I did take drugs. It is something I deeply, deeply regret. Drugs damage lives. They are dangerous and it was a mistake. Look, it's all good, I'm so good having this honesty, but wouldn't it be more honest if you just said, look, I took cocaine on several occasions. I took it more than once because it was fucking great the first time, so I kept on doing it, and I loved every minute of it. Talking in session shit for hours on end, talking for shit for hours on end gave me great practice becoming a Tory MP. Why do they always have to say it was a mistake and I, I regret it? Why not just say, yeah, it was great, I loved it, but I don't want to do it anymore? That would be being more honest, wouldn't it? And this, um, this third one, this third story is just so daft and pointless. Listen to this. 
A South Coast vegetarian restaurant has become the first UK food business to be shut down for infusing its dishes with CBD cannabis oil, despite its owners saying that they were assured less than a year ago by police and tracing standards that the products were legal. Yeah, The Canner Kitchen in Brighton has been closed since a, pre a police raid at the start of May. The owners, whose slogan is, let food be thy medicine, face losing hundreds of thousands of pounds and laying off 15 staff. Sam Evolution, that's quite a good surname, isn't it? Is that your real name, Sam Evolution? Anyway, Sam Evolution, Canna's director, said he had evidence that the police and the UK Trading Standards Agency had given the go-ahead to open a restaurant that sold food infused with CBD oil last July. Speaking for the first time about the raid on May the 11th, Evolution said he and his staff went out of their way to inform the police about what they were selling. On July the... I don't know why I'm giving him a stoner voice, but I will anyway. On July the 1st, 2018, we contacted the Med Police via email in an attempt to verify the official UK legal position on the sale of CDP hemp flour. Their response was, as long as you don't have, as long as you have made reasonable inquiries and it has been said that they are legal, then there is no criminal offence. We made this inquiry to ensure that we were always operating well within the law. And then they got raided by a police force. You know, the police force that hasn't got enough police to come and see you if you get burgled or beaten up or robbed. Yeah, them. And they've cost a small business hundreds of thousands of pounds. They may have put 15 people out of a job after being told it was OK for putting CBD oil that doesn't even get you stoned. I mean, what's the point in taking it? No, but it's good for you. It doesn't even get you high. And then they've had their cafe closed down. Twat! What a mad world we live in. Is it okay? Gonna do it anyway. Rich people doing good eco things. Rich people doing good eco things. Rich people doing good eco things. It's not where you're from, it's where you're at. Right, so rich people doing good eco things. This week I'm actually talking about Patagonia. Um, not the country, the clothing brand. Um, I think we've talked on here before. Um, but this is what it says. Patagonia is having a very good year. Under the new corporate tax code passed by Republicans, they're paying a lot less in federal taxes. $10 million less to be exact. Patagonia's CEO announced her company is donating all $10 million to non-profit groups who work on issues related to climate change and the environment. Based on last year's irresponsible tax cut, Patagonia will owe less in taxes this year. $10 million less, in fact, um, CEO Rose Macario writes. Instead of putting the money back into our business, we are responding by putting $10 million back into the planet. Our home planet needs it more than we do. Far too many people have suffered the consequences of global warming in recent months, and the political response has so far been woefully inadequate, and the denial is just evil, she wrote. Taxes protect the most vulnerable in our society, our public lands, and other life-giving resources, she added. In spite of this, the Trump administration initiated a corporate tax cut, threatening these services at the expense of our planet. Well, good on you, Rose Macario. Another example of... Rich people doing good eco things. It's not where you're from, it's where you're at. And you can't help it if you're a posh rich twat. Ah. Yeah, so Mother Earth, her name is Gaia. Um, if we look at this week's climate stuff, there's so much you don't know where to start, but possibly with the conversation between Prince Charles and Trumpy Pumpy last week that went on longer than planned. Um, and apparently Charles kept at it for 45 minutes. 
But uh, what we found out at the end of this, thank God, at least we found out America hasn't got a problem with its climate. So that's really good news. We can all relax now and get back to mindless consumption, eh? Because um, because it's all been sorted. Because Donald has told us it's been sorted. And this is what he said about his conversation with Prince Charles. He is really into climate change, and I think that's great. What he really wants and what he really feels warmly about is the future. He wants to make sure future generations have climate that is good climate, as opposed to a disaster, and I agree. Um, Donald, I don't know if you should be talking about climate change and say he feels warmly about climate change. You could have used a better term, but anyway, you are Donald Trump, but I'll carry on. Um, Trump pushed back at the suggestion that the US should do more, he said. I did say, well, the United States right now has among the cleanest climates there are based on all statistics, and it's getting even getting better because I agree with that. We want the best water, the cleanest water. It's crystal clean. Has to be crystal clean, clear. And then he said, China, India, Russia, many other nations, they have not got very good air, not very good water, and the sense of pollution. If you go to certain cities, you can't even breathe, and now that air is going up. Um, clear as a fucking bell, that, Donald. Um, seriously, what are you on about? This is the... I was going to say the most powerful man on the planet, but he's actually the second most powerful man on the planet after his boss, Vladimir Putin, isn't he? And the second most powerful man on the planet, he's got the nuclear codes and he's got the fucking, he's got the diction and the intellect of a five-year-old and not a very bright five-year-old at that. And I think I'm probably being really unfair to five-year-olds. And following on from that, of course, um, they've given the go-ahead for rebranding of natural gas. And it says, Trump administration rebrands fossil fuels as molecules of U.S. freedom. The U.S. State Department has apparently started referring to fossil fuels as molecules of freedom, and specifically natural gas as freedom gas, according to its latest press release. I am pleased that the Department of Energy is doing what it can to promote an efficient regulatory system that allows for molecules of U.S. freedom to be exported to the world, um, said Stephen Wimberg. Molecules of freedom. Molecules of freedom, for fuck's sake. Um, Remember back back during the Iraq war when France wouldn't go along with all the American bullshit and join the invasion? They actually renamed French fries Freedom Fries. And it seems all you have to do, isn't it, to win over a percentage of the American population is put the word freedom in front of anything and they lap it up. But anyway, we've got freedom gas now, haven't we? Molecules of US freedom, molecules of freedom. What an absolutely mental world we live in. And while we're on the subject of climate, um, a report from Australia has come out by saying by 2050, we are fucked, yeah? The climate change analysis was written by a former fossil fuel executive and backed by the former chief of Australia's military. They have endorsed a terrifying new report on how human civilization could collapse entirely in the coming decades due to climate change. It describes climate change as near to mid-term existential threat to human civilization. Near to mid-term. This isn't long-term. And describes what continuing business as usual practice could lead to in the next 30 years. Our planetary and human systems are reaching a point of no return by mid-century in which the prospect of a largely inhabitable Earth leads to the breakdown of nations and the international order. I went through about three different accents then, didn't I? Sorry. The analysis states that in order to avoid this scenario, efforts akin in scale to World War II emergency mobilization must be taken, this time focused on rapidly building zero emissions um, industrial whatever. What is it? Sorry, industrial system. Yeah. Um, Human current trajectory will likely ensure at least three degrees Celsius of global heating, which could trigger amplifying effects and therefore cause uh, further warming. This would drive the rapid collapse of key ecosystems, including coral reefs, Amazon rainforest and the Arctic. The results 
would be devastating. One billion people would be forced to escape unlivable conditions and two billion people would face food, water, face water security. Agriculture in the subtropics would collapse, causing, causing global food production to suffer dramatically. Well, that's fucking cheered me right up, that, hasn't it? Um, and here in the UK, the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer said this week that we can't afford to go carbon neutral by 2050 because it will cost a lot of money. And apparently, we can't afford it. Listen, we can't afford to survive as a species because it will mess the economy, economy up, apparently. Um, yeah, I definitely can't see any fault in that logic that we can't afford to save the world because it will mess up the economy. Does anyone else sort of... It, it's mental, isn't it? Mental. I'm going to stop there because it's just all mental. Right, well, you may have heard me and Len um, mention panpsychism briefly, briefly when I was um, talk, or discussed listening to the Sam Harris podcast. And it was a podcast and he was interviewing his wife, Anaka, a name I think is Anaka, Anaka, not sure how you pronounce it, um, who's just written a book on consciousness and it's called Conscious, A Brief Guide to the Fundamental Mystery of the Mind. And uh, as I said, it seemed that after doing all the reading and stuff, she was coming round to the conclusion that panpsychism may be the explanation or the answer to the consciousness issue. Um, and I've discussed it before, but I just thought I'd go over it again, just so people might understand um, it's, well, my take on it anyway. And the problem with consciousness is no matter how hard we look for it in the human brain, we can't seem to find it. It's not there. And though there are those that believe only humans and possibly other higher species are capable of conscious thoughts of sort of self-awareness, um, if that's the case, but we know everything on the planet comes from the same place and all origins, as you know, the same origins, don't they, as life on Earth. We all share common ancestors. So I think it's not that much of a stretch to believe that everything might have a basic consciousness and the more complex the being, then the more developed the consciousness. And I do think it's sort of one of these human exceptionalist things to think that we're the only ones capable of self-awareness. And I don't think we are an exceptional species. I just think we're just another species. And um, anyway, panpsychism pan isn't new. It's sort of the old Buddhist belief in the conscious universe. It's just been sort of revisited now that we're starting to look a lot more at consciousness. Um, the current materialist way of thinking has a problem with consciousness because um, it, they believe everything is made of stuff, isn't it? The universe is made of stuff and matter. So consciousness at some level must reside in matter. So why should it reside in some bits of matter and not others? You know, there is this there's this, this problem that's called the hard problem. And, and panpsychism now is being taught again as a sort of another, not another whole branch of science, but another way, part of science that, to explore rather than just some sort of new age um, hippy dippy sort of concept. And I think um, the more I read about it, I think I agree with panpsychism because it, it started with my own journey when I, uh, two or three years ago when I started looking at plant intelligence and there was like fungal intelligence, slime mold intelligence, tree intelligence. And it seems to me that everything, um, everything exhibits a basic level of intelligence or consciousness or whatever you want to describe it. Everything has some self-awareness of its surroundings, of its conditions that it's in, and it can react accordingly. And, and panpsychism argues that this consciousness, this awareness, this intelligence, whatever words you want to use, um, exists in the smallest of atoms, 
um, the you know quarks, neutrinos, DNA, or whatever, um, it, and it argues that consciousness is actually the building block of life. Um, and it sounds perfectly reasonable and sensible to me. Um, the idea that only humans and higher apes have self-awareness, it sort of sounds like something that belongs in the 19th century. Um, anyway, what I'm going to do soon, um, I'm going to buy the book and I'll probably talk about it a bit more because it really fascinates me, doesn't it? Um, having a look at the deepest secrets of our souls. talking to me saying we are your friends right that's all i've got time for thank you very much once again for len for being on i love having him on we have some really interesting chats mostly though i want to thank you lot um for, for listening and being such loyal listeners um if you want to get in touch, get in touch at the Frogbit blog at gmail.com and, you know, either come on, you can do your own rant, you can record your own rant and I'll put it on. I think it'd be quite funny if there was some more contributions. I'm going to, soon I'm going to have Mark. I don't even remember Mark, the other minimalist. He's going to, he's going away, traveling the world and going to do loads of good eco stuff and you know and help clear up plastic and look after elephants and all that stuff so he's going to be my roving correspondent soon so i'm going to have a regular roving correspondent because he's going at the end of summer i'm going to get him on um just before then to talk about his planned trip and stuff and um, kind of waffled on a bit there anyway so remember this is available on youtube if you prefer to subscribe through youtube um, and uh, well that's it then um, i hope you enjoyed the show and i will speak to you soon then bye the frog beat blog Beat block.